Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining today's webinar. It's the Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Sciences, a multi university webinar series. This has been the seventh week um, for this webinar series. My name is Chen Wang. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering from Penn State University. What you see now is uh, our organizing committee. Thanks so much for Dr. Devesh Ranjan. He initiated this uh, webinar series. And uh, thank to all my colleagues on the organizing committee to make this webinar series really successful. And next slide. Yeah, so before I started today's uh, seminar, I want to announce actually for next week. Uh, next week's theme will be on interfacial science. We'll have the moderator, Dr. Ravi Prasher from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And the two speakers, Dr. Mata Hazel from Georgia Tech and Dr. Wen Xiaopan from University of Wisconsin-Madison. Next one. And today is my honor to introduce uh, our moderator, Dr. Christy uh, Mokensen. Professor Mokensen is the uh, professor uh, and department head, the chair, William E. Boeing Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the University of Washington, Seattle. And she received her bachelor and master's degree in mechanical engineering from Boston University in 93 and 94 and one more master in applied mathematics in, uh, from Harvard in 96, and finally a PhD in engineering science uh, in 99 from Harvard as well. So her research interest uh, was on, uh, is on nonlinear systems where sensing and actuation at integrated stability in switch system with delay and incorporation of operational constraints, such as communication delay, in the control of multi-vehicle systems. Her research applications include both traditional autonomous vehicle systems, such as the fixed wing aircraft underwater gliders, as well as the novel systems, such as bio-inspired underwater propulsion, bio-inspired age of flight, humanization making, and neuroengineering. So it's really my pleasure and to have her today as the moderator. So without further delay, I'm going to pass the floor to her to introduce today's theme and also our speakers. Great. Well, Thanks. thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity. So I was asked to give a little bit of context about this topic. So biorobotics um, actually covers a good bit of territory. Really, it's anything where um, as engineers and scientists, we're looking to nature to get um, some ideas about things that we can do better for engineering, either just what performance maybe we can aim for, or what are some of the design features that might uh, want to be incorporated into systems. So um, this is a kind of approach to engineering that, to be honest, I think personally has been going on since before we started doing, or really when we started doing engineering and building tools of any form. Um, and I think people know a number of uh, some of these classical examples from Da Vinci, from the Wright brothers. They looked at a uh, flight of uh, birds when they were designing their vehicles, the initial um, airplanes that they designed. Uh, we've seen a lot of applications lately in things like, like the gecko grip for um, climbing walls, um, spider silk. Just a, a broad range of materials and capabilities that um, uh, we'd like to be able to achieve. And so really it's still the case that biology outperforms engineering in a, in a wide range of ways. Um, and so what many of us who would work in bio-inspired systems are interested in is how do you perform relevant analysis and then validate it with experimental studies? And then also how do you trade off things like computational complexity with the system fidelity um, and and then do this to, of course, create better engineered seat, uh, systems to, in general, um, serve societal needs. So we have two speakers today who are going to talk about the parts of this domain that they work on. Um, so our first one, and I was I was told to introduce both of them first and then they'll handle it from there and then we'll do um, questions at the end, so you can put your questions in chat and then we'll call on people at the end. Um, so our first speaker will be Jean-Michel Mongeau. 
Uh, he is at Penn State. He's an assistant professor there in mechanical engineering, and he directs the bio motion systems lab, which studies neuromechanics and control of aerial and terrestrial locomotion in animals and machines. And he is a recipient of an AFOSR YIP award. Um, he got his PhD from Berkeley in 2013 in biophysics. Then he, he, before that, he got his bachelor's in biomedical engineering from Northwestern in 2007. Um, as a graduate student, he was an Eiger fellow as well as an NSF graduate research fellow. And in between his graduate work and um, going to Penn, he was a postdoctoral scholar at UCLA, uh, funded by the Howard Hughes and Army Research Offices. And uh, he will tell us all about his work. He's been featured in a number of um, media places. And then the second speaker is Suasa, and I apologize if I don't get this quite right, but Kodan Daramaya, hopefully I got that close. Uh, who is um, at the University of Missis uh, sorry, Minnesota as an assistant professor. And he did his undergraduate work at um, Visveswaraya sorry, Technological University in India. And then he got his master's degree at University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and a PhD from Georgia Tech, all in mechanical engineering. And then he did postdoctoral training at, uh, at MIT in... Um, Edward Boyden's laboratory in the Media Lab and McGovern Institute for Brain Research. And his work is at the intersection of robotics, precision engineering, and neuroscience. Uh, so he did um, also did a postdoctoral study, and he looks at robotic tools for observing and analyzing neuronal circuit computations in intact living brains. And I know enough about that to know it's as hard as it sounds. Um, he has received an R.V. Jones Memorial Award from the American Society for Precision Engineering. That was in 2010. In 2012, he was recognized by Forbes magazine as one of the 30 under 30 list of rising researchers in science and healthcare. Okay, so I will leave it at that for our introductions. Our first speaker is Dr. Monchot, and he will, I think, share his screen. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, let, I apologize for the technical issues earlier. I downloaded the application, which seems to work better. Uh, so let's see if I can share uh, my screen here. Um, can folks see my screen? Yeah, it looks good. And put in a presentation mode. Yep. All right, everyone can see the screen okay? Yep. All right, excellent. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Dr. Morganson, for the introduction. Um, and thank you, uh, Georgia Tech, for organizing uh, this seminar series. It's really exciting to give us a sense of normalcy <laughs> in a time uh, that's been challenging for all of us, particularly for us assistant professors trying to get our labs going in a global pandemic. So. Uh, thank you for organizing this. I'm very appreciative. Um, and thank you, Dr. Morgan, for agreeing to moderate uh, this uh, um, seminar today. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, some recent work in my lab, uh, some of it that's been recently published, uh, other that's been uh, is an under review now. Uh, and I'm going to be talking mostly on the biology side of my work in the interest of time. I'm going to be talking about uh, particularly flight control in flies. And uh, so reverse engineering the brain is one of the 14 grand challenges for engineering in the 21st century, according to the National uh, Academy of Engineering. Uh, so the release of, of a list of 14 grand challenges and, and the brain is not surprisingly one of the grand challenges. Uh, this, you know, reverse engineering the brain promised to really great advances in a number of fields, including healthcare manufacturing and uh, communication. And particularly for developing general purpose AI, which has been kind of an elusive uh, thing. Uh, and we are, as we understand more about the brain, maybe we can build better general purpose AI. Uh, so there are tremendous opportunities uh, in understanding uh, this organ. So uh, as uh, Dr. Morganson alluded to, living systems are incredibly complex. Uh, so they're made of interconnected element, 
uh, they can change and respond to env environmental conditions to experience. Uh, they have emergent properties as well. And uh, one system I spend quite a bit of time thinking about is the fly brain. Uh, here's a picture of the visual processing center of a fly brain. So this is an electron micrograph picture of a tiny region of the fly brain. You can see here at the top are the photoreceptors. Uh, so if visual information goes to the photoreceptors and then descends into towards the central brain. And a team of people uh, sought to uh, figure out the underlying structures of a tiny part of this visual processing center uh, in the brain. And here's a picture of a 50 micron, basically uh, a cube of a uh, brain tissue from the visual processing center of a fly. And so that 50 micron cube uh, section has almost 400 neurons and over 8,000 synapses. And from that, this team was able to develop a connectome and this took a team of 30 plus people more than six years to decipher just the structure. We still don't know how it works. This is just structure. And this represents 0.01% of the fly brain. So fly brain has 200,000 neurons. And we actually don't know how many synapses fly brains have because some of these synapses are electrical synapses and they remain really difficult to tag with genetic tools. So this is a really outstanding problem on the sensory side. On the motor side, the problem is just as challenging. Uh, if we look at a cockroach, which has a million neurons in its nervous system, uh, they have 230 muscles. And those 230 muscles actuate 84 different joint motions. So this is a, not only is it a complicated problem on the sensory side, but also on the motor side. So my lab's interested in what solution exists in nature to control complex system, particularly the complex system of choice is animal locomotion. And we work at the interface of biology and engineering. And uh, today uh, I'm gonna focus in the interest of time on uh, the part where I, wear I get to wear my biologist hat, uh, where we do engineering-based biology. And so my lab is the Biomotion Systems Lab. We're interested in neuromechanical control locomotion. So we're interested in how sensors, the brain, muscles, and the body work together to con control complex motion. And we've been focusing parts particularly on insect scale uh, locomotion. And uh, when appropriate, we've been extracting principles from neuromechanics to develop uh, more agile insect scale robots. So I've worked uh, in developing better tactile sensor in the past and uh, insect scale robot would enhance maneuverability. I've also done work in neuroscience in my postdoc, but I'm not gonna have time to talk about this today. So locomotion can be deconstructed into a simple cascade where the brain sends signals to the muscle, muscles act on the body and the environment. So that simple cascade is overly simplistic and locomotion is inherently closed loop. And so we, in my lab, we use what we call a neuromechanical control framework, realizing that locomotion is, is inescapably closed loop. And uh, the goal of my lab is to perturb this well-tuned feedback loop to try to understand control architecture of animal locomotion. So for example, we can open this feedback loop by inhibiting modalities. We can perturb the system with disturbances to try to understand how it recovers. And particularly, we're interested in understanding this elusive neural controller, right, the brain. And how can we hypothesize the function of this black box, which is very difficult to access? And in, in particularly lately, we've been interested in using tools from control theory uh, to predict what neural information might be required uh, to control complex movement. And control theory kind of gives us a natural set of tools that, that integrates body and sensor uh, dynamics. And so the, my framework, the idea is to use mathematical tools, particularly from control theory, to try to predict the function of the nervous system, and then use techniques in neurobiology when appropriate to address testable hypotheses. Otherwise, I think we're at a loss if we study a nervous system without a framework that connects both sensing and movement. So in my lab, uh, we focus on insect scale locomotion, both on land and in air. And today I'm gonna focus on our work in fruit flies, which has become one of the most important system to study brain form function. And I'm gonna be talking, sort of giving you two sort of vignettes of, of work I've been doing lately. 
Uh, one is on active sensing in flight, in insect flight, and the other one's gonna be on adaptive control in insect flight. So spatial orientation control is really critical for agile flight. Uh, so uh, for example, a flying fly or a bee uh, must coordinate its actuator, i.e. its wings, with its body and its head movement. It has to do so in a way that is well coordinated so it can stabilize gaze, find features in the world, and direct uh, uh, goal-directed behavior. So active sensing is a topic in actually both biology and engineering. Uh, we can define an active sensor as a sensor that changes its state parameters according to the sensing strategy. And effectively, this coupling between sensing and actuation introduces a nonlinearity in control. And in the past, uh, in my work, I've used, I studied both animals and robots to understand how active sensing strategies can improve ta task performance. So here on the right, I'm showing a video of some past work where we, I studied tactile sensing uh, to understand how animals use active sensing uh, to their advantage. And in my lab now, we're interested in active vision uh, in flight. So that's what I'm gonna be talking uh, next. So to put my work in a control framework here, uh, what we're going to do is play some tricks on the fly. So we're gonna have a visual disturbance, which is going to uh, destabilize uh, the gaze stabilization reflex of the fly. And we're going to play another trick to the fly. We're going to inhibit its body motion, and we're also gonna inhibit its head motion. This, so this will enable us to uh, open and close feedback loops so we can understand the underlying uh, control architecture. And in my lab, uh, we use virtual reality systems like this one to study flight. So we call this the virtual reality flight simulator. Uh, so it's, we call this particular one the rigid tether where uh, we put a fly in basically on a stick and we can track the wing steering efforts of the fly. And using high-speed video, we can track the basically the, the active camera of the fly, its head. So what's an important point about insects is their eyes are fixed to their head. So that simplifies the problem quite a bit if you're trying to understand active vision. So here's an experiment uh, where we use system identification tool to try to understand the coordination between basically the active camera of the fly, its head, and its body via tracking wing steering responses. So in this particular uh, video here, uh, we're using a sum of sign stimulus, which is exciting uh, different uh, frequencies in the system. And uh, we can track both the head and the wing steering responses uh, to this uh, sort of noisy stimulus. And this is work that was we recently published in uh, PNAS. So uh, for this, we're gonna use a control framework for studying this problem. So we're gonna open the feedback loop by uh, fixing the head of the fly. And in that case, we have a fairly straightforward transform between our visual stimulus and the wing steering efforts of the fly. And we're also gonna allow the fly to move its head. So that's the head precondition. And the head precondition here, the fly can close the loop. So it's using its head to effectively shape the visual motion into an error signal. And from this framework, we can derive a number of different transforms between our, our stimulus and the head and wing uh, responses. So sort of a quick mathematical aside here, we can demonstrate mathematically that these are distinct systems. So on the left is the open loop system where we have a transform between the visual stimulus and our wing steering responses. On the right is a closed loop system. And we can demonstrate that if the head is in fact tracking or compensating for the visual disturbance, then our, the visual stimulus is being reshaped by head movement, which is shown here mathematically. And we also have an additional transform, which is between the stimulus and the head. And what's important here is that we can't, in this case, in the closed loop form, we can't just look at the transform between visual motion and the, the wing steering res responses because the head might actually be shaping uh, the input. So what we found is that the head was re remarkably good at compensating for this disturbance, this visual disturbance. So we found that up to 60% of the retinal slip error was reduced by the head. So this is a plot of the gain and the phase of the response to a noisy stimulus, which I showed early in the video. And remarkably, the, the phase 
of the head response is very close to zero. In fact, we computed the delay of the head response into it's on the order of 10 milliseconds. So it takes about 10 milliseconds for the head to move following the onset of the visual stimulus. So it's a really effective sensor. In contrast, the wings we found were much less in phase than the head. Uh, you can see here the phase response uh, lags behind what we found in the head. Now, if naively, we just look at the stimulus to wing beat uh, amplitude response or wing steering response. We find that more or less the, uh, the, the body plot, the gain and the phase plot have not changed. But we, we consider the nonlinearity that could be introduced by this active sensor. Now, if we look at the error to wing, we find that the head movements double the wing gain. So this was a very surprising result to us, demonstrating potentially tight coupling between a sensor and an actuator. So what we demonstrated here is a, a nonlinearity introduced by uh, this active head movement. Next, we look at what is the relationship between the sensor, i.e. the head, and the actuator. So we use coherence in this case to estimate correlation in the frequency of domain. So a coherence of one uh, in a system implies linearity. And uh, so the coherence can, for a signal can be, is defined as the cross-spectral density over the auto-spectral density of the signal. But we found the head was very coherent with the stimulus. So it did a remarkably, remarkable job of compensating for this visual disturbance. In contrast, the wings uh, were operating in a much lower coherence. So this is in the head-free case. And we said, okay, so what happens if you fix the head? Well, that actually influenced the correlation uh, between the stimulus and the head. So we thought it wouldn't have much of an influence, but we found that if you fix the sensor, you have a large difference in coherence. So now the, the coherence of the wings is even lower. It's actually been almost half. And then finally, we look at, so what's the coherence between the sensor, the, the head, and the actuator, the wings? And remarkably, we found that the coherence between the sensor and the actuator were greater than the coherence between the stimulus and the actuator, dem demonstrating a very tight coupling between sensing and actuation in flight flight, which had not pre previously been known. Next, we look at whether the head and the wings have some natural coherence in flight. So we presented these flies with just a static stimulus to see are the head and wings naturally correlated in their sort of search strategy. And we found that coherence was, was rather low. But if we introduced a stimulus, then we found that coherence improved dramatically, uh, demonstrating that uh, the coupling between the sensor and the actuator are task dependent. So here I've summarized uh, these results here. Next, we looked at what is the delay between the sensor and actuator in flight flights? And we found that the head responds four times faster than the wings. So we look at the transform between the head and the wings, and we found that it operated a pretty much constant phase offset, which means a constant delay. And we found that the um, overall, the wings consistently lag the head by about 30 milliseconds. So the wings, for the wings to, to, to start to see a, a change in response, it takes about 40 milliseconds for that information to travel it through the fly. Whereas for the head, it's only 10 milliseconds. So what we demonstrated here is there's a temporal order in this control system where the active head loop is basically shaping visual information, which is then coordinating the wings. And surprisingly, we found the head fixation uh, decreases the overall thrust that are generated by the wings. So we found that uh, by summing here the wing beat amplitude across many trials for head free and head fixed flies, that fixing the actuator decreases the thrust that a fly can apply. So overall, we found that the head leaks the wings uh, four to, by factor four, and head fixation decreases flight motor performance. So finally, we revisited a classic model of insect vision, which is called the elementary motion detector. Uh, this was a model developed after World War II by a group in Germany, and it's effectively the simple model to extract direction of motion. And this is a bio-inspired um, uh, um, bio model of, of uh, vision, which was derived from looking at beetles and how beetles respond uh, to visual motion. 
And uh, this model is effectively a delay and correlate model, and it requires two eyes to be, or two facets of an eyes to be able to discriminate, discriminate motion direction. And so uh, it requires two units, and these are called omatidia because the facets on a compound eye of an insect is called an, an omatidium. So you need two omatidia uh, to be able to at least uh, discriminate direction uh, of motion. And uh, with this delay and correlate, uh, model, you can extract whether the world is moving right or the world is moving left. And this model has been in incredibly influential. It's one of the, the one of the models that's sort of stood the test of time in neuroscience. So it's a it's been a model that's been applied not only in insect uh, vision but also in mammalian vision to understand uh, basic computations of the visual system. And it's been used to inspire uh, visual sensors on robots. So here I'm showing. Uh, different examples of robots that have been inspired by this uh, elementary motion detector model or EMD model uh, for short using a multifaceted eye. And the EMD model uh, makes a simple prediction about uh, responses across speeds. So if you move a visual field to this beetle that I showed on the previous slide at different speed, you kind of find this bell-shaped bell, bell curve like this, where initially the, the steering response will increase and eventually it will decrease as you get to higher speeds. So that's the prediction of the EMD model uh, in terms of the behavioral response. So we decided to revisit this model in light of the fact that we realized that really this EMD is not a fixed uh, uh, sensor. It's a sensor that's mounted on an actuator. So we wanted to see how does including uh, active head movement influence the uh, tuning of this EMD model. So we did a simulation with a head fix uh, EMD, and we did a simulation with a, with a head free EMD, where we actually fed in real head angles that we measured in our experiments. And we had to use uh, some nonlinear fitting here because this is a nonlinear model. The EMD is a nonlinear model, so we had to use some fitting to, fitting to extract both the gain and the phase between our visual input and the EMD output. And so first we recreated, recreated the canonical uh, head fix EMD model, which is again, this bell shaped curve, except this, this time I'm not showing the log scale. So it's, it looks slightly different, but it still has this bell shape uh, to it. And then we included active head movement that we measured in flies. And what we found is that active head movements are basically doubling the visual encoding range. So they're shifting the curve, they're shifting the maximum to the right two times, and they're also increasing the range. And what's really remarkable here is that if you compare this uh, response to the sensitivity optimum of visual interneurons in the fly brain, which are involved in visual motor processing, uh, particularly the HS neuron, which has been studied for decades as one being a, the most important neuron for the uh, mediating the gaze optimotor reflex, we found the sensitivity optimum of that neuron matches our prediction really well in terms of range and peak. So what they're showing is that the head movements on the fly are mapping the visual inputs onto the sensitivity, sensitivity optimum of these neurons. We also found that decrease, closing the loop will decrease the overall phase of the head optimotor response. So if we compare our simulation using the EMD, uh, which is shown in black here and in blue. So here I'm showing the phase, not the gain, the phase of the head fix and head free simulation, we found there's a very large phase lag. But if we compare that to our experimental data, we found that uh, closing the loop, i.e. The, the animal operates at a much lower phase offset, uh, demonstrating that uh, this closed loop system has a transformative influence on the phase response. So in summary here, what we discover is, is that head movements are both shaping and coordinating flight motor responses. So we found that there's this very rapid head visual motor loop that is acting on the order of about 10 milliseconds, which shapes visual information, which then um, gets and then acts onto the wings and delayed by 30 milliseconds. And this generates a head coordinated wing steering response. And we're using this information now to develop neuromechanical models of spatial orientation control. Uh, so we have a mathematical model of this uh, multiple degree of freedom system. And we've been using optimal control theory 
uh, to assess the influence of mechanics, neural delays, and controller gains on both the stability and performance of the optomotor reflex. So next, I'm going to talk about uh, some more recent work on adaptive control in insect flight. So uh, biological systems are always facing environmental uncertainties. Uh, in fact, you could argue that environmental uncertainties are really the norm rather than the exception in nature, whether it's a gust of wind, a change in light condition. Uh, these are happen all the time to flying critters, whether it's an insect or a bird. Um, and in insects in particular, damage can arise from uh, many different, uh, for, for many different reasons. For example, many insects suffer molting defects. Uh, they have disease, predation, aggression from mate selection. All of these things can contribute to internal damage to flies. And uh, biologists have gone out into the field and look at arthropods, and they found that in nature, about 40% of arthropods have some sort of damage to an appendage, right? So this is really high number, and many are missing appendages. If we look at dragonflies specifically, a flying insect, about 75% of dragonflies in nature have some sort of wing wear, right? Demonstrating again that th these uncertainties, these, these, this damage that, that insects can sustain um, are, are really the norm rather than, than the exception. And what's interesting about insects, unlike birds, is they can't regrow wings. So if an insect suffers wing damage, they have to use a neuromechanical control strategy to compensate for, uh, for example, a loss in aerodynamic surface due to wing damage. And so in my lab, so going back to the control framework here, we're really trying to understand uh, both if, if animals are, are either robust and or adaptive. So robust control in, in control theory is defined as the ability to maintain function in the presence of known uncertainties. And so as engineers, we can design robust control laws and, dem robust control laws and demonstrate that our system will remain stable within certain bounds, whether it's due to plant uh, uncertainty or other uncertainties that we know ahead of time, right? In, uh, on the other hand, adaptive control is another branch of control theory that deals with the presence of, of unpredictable uncertainties. So uncertainties that you may not know ahead of time. And uh, biological systems are, are likely to use adaptive uh, control to be able to adapt in the face of these uncertainties like I showed in the earlier slide. So uh, it's likely that animals can uh, modulate, for example, the gain of their neural controller to be able to adapt to, uh, for example, wing damage. And so our framework here models the inherent uh, nonlinearities and time invariance of insect flight. And so in my lab, lately, we've been developing new uh, paradigms to study adaptive control in flight. Uh, so this is our 3D magnetic tether system, uh, which allows flies to freely rotate about the yaw axis. And we can suspend the fly in a virtual reality system uh, by, so we can basically fool the fly into thinking that the world is moving and the fly will, uh, will track our visual stimuli. So they're operating in closed loop. And then we use uh, high speed uh, infrared sensitive cameras to capture uh, the motion of the fly at really high spatial and temporal resolution. And lately, we've been using deep learning uh, to rapidly extract uh, kinematics from these animals. So we've been training neural networks uh, to extract uh, how the wings are moving, how the sensors are moving, how the body is moving. And so this enables us to do fairly rapid 3D reconstruction of of these different parts on the animals at over 8,000 frames per second. So this is important because the wings are beating at about 200, about 250 times per second. Uh, so we need to slow it down uh, quite a bit to be able to track uh, wing kinematics. And we've also been uh, combining uh, this tool with uh, uh, some modeling we've done to understand how flies might deal with uncertainties, particularly wing damage. So we can use a quasi steady model to, under, to, to predict uh, what kind of torques uh, uh, flies might face in the presence of uh, wing damage, whether it is a cord-wise damage or span-wise damage, we can estimate what uh, torque asymmetries might uh, uh, emerge on this damage and understand how flies might compensate for these. So this is a, a, a plot here that shows a normalized torque as a function of wing damage, where wing damage is increasing 
uh, to the right here. This is the ratio of the third moment of, of, of inertia of the wing um, for the damage case and the intact case. So I'm going to show some recent results in quantifying adaptive control and in Sean, following. Can you just wrap damage. it up in two minutes? Thank Sorry? You. Can you wrap it up in two minutes? Uh, yeah, I can try. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I'm going to show some, some data here uh, with a uh, cordwise cut of, of the wing. So we're going to remove a tiny part of the wing of fly and we'll look at the bottom view of the fly uh, with video. And uh, what the video here in the arena frame, uh, so the fly stabilizing our, our visual pattern. And what we found is that uh, the wing that's damaged uh, compensates for the loss of aerodynamic surface by increasing its stroke angle. And here's a cartoon picture here showing the damaged side is operating at a larger stroke angle or wing beat amplitude versus the contralateral side, which is undamaged. So here's the wing beat amplitude for flies that are intact. And here are the wing beat amplitudes for flies with damaged wings. We found that the flies are compensating, so they're adapting to this perturbation. And uh, we found that wing damage decreases flight performance uh, so overall, we found that flies tended to drift towards a damaged wing because of asymmetric torque production. And uh, we found that wing damage uh, decreases visual motor gain uh, in phase in a frequency independent manner. And uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through this here. Uh, we can use tools from control theory to uh, effectively, effectively go from the or closed loop system from experimental data to try to understand uh, what exactly is a neural controller doing to adapt to these changes in a uh, wing surface? And we've also found that the fly abdomen, uh, which is basically used as a rudder, uh, compensate for this wing damage. Um, and we found that the flies do actually shift their center of mass to compensate for uh, the loss of aerodynamic uh, surface. So here in the interest of time, uh, I'm going to uh, close it up. Uh, to make sure our next speaker has plenty of time. And I'm going to acknowledge my uh, funding sources and the graduate students in my lab who did uh, this work. So uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. I think we hold the questions until at the end. But, oh, okay. Yep, but thank you. So we'll I'll keep an eye on that chat for any questions people might have. You can go ahead and type them in at any point. And um, uh, Jean-Michel can be watching and, and you can chat answers back and forth, but then we'll come back to a live Q&A um, after we have the second presentation. Great, so I just stop sharing here. Okay. And then, so also, are you gonna share your screen now? Yes. Uh, okay. Are I go into presentation mode? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, again, thank you, Devesh, and uh, the committee for giving us the opportunity to speak uh, at this webinar. And uh, I've been uh, logging in for some of the other uh, talks, and uh, it's really been uh, great listening to all the stuff that we're doing uh, within Big Ten Plus. Uh, and also, since this is uh, being organized by uh, uh, David at Georgia Tech, uh, this is sort of a virtual homecoming since uh, I did most of my PhD. Uh, I did my PhD at Georgia Tech uh, with Craig Forrest. And some of the work that I'll be talking about uh, leading up to the work that we're doing in our lab was done in Craig's lab. So, um, my lab uh, is the Biosensing and Biorobotics Laboratory, uh, where we are trying to build better neural interfaces uh, to understand and study the brain. And it was great that we had uh, uh, the previous talk, uh, where which established a lot of the motivation for the work that we're doing, which is that the brain, uh, which mediates pretty much everything we do, our senses, actions, thoughts, and emotions, uh, is this really incredibly complex organ. Uh, and the human brain has 10 to the power 11 to 10 to the power 12 uh, cells. Uh, if you take the smallest mammalian brain, uh, uh, among the smallest mammalian brains, for instance, the uh, mouse brain that has 70 million neurons, 
uh, thousands of different types of cells in terms of function and structure and anatomy and incredibly complex uh, uh, circuits. And understanding how these cells, uh, uh, what these cells are doing during behavior helps us understand the neuronal computations underlying everything that we do. And uh, my lab is focusing on developing technologies, uh, specifically uh, robotic technologies that can tackle and capture some of this complexity. So, and there are lots of opportunities for engineers to do that. Uh, when we sort of look at the spatiotemporal scales at which neural computations are occurring, uh, you can sort of think about the brain uh, and look at uh, single cells. Uh, so single cells and neurons that are receiving these chemical signals called synaptic inputs. They're integrating it, them in some nonlinear fashion, and they are providing uh, uh, inputs to downstream neurons in the form of spikes, releasing neurotransmitters, and so on. These uh, individual neurons are parts of much larger uh, networks of cells, uh, and these networks are distributed throughout the brain. And all this computation is mediating our behavior, our interaction with the world. And one of the challenges that neuroscientists face is that while we have tools that allow us to study uh, single cells with, uh, at exquisite uh, precision and uh, uh, detail, uh, these tools don't really scale if you want to study uh, whole intact networks. Or the tools that allow us to look at single cells in uh, you know, networks uh, that are isolated uh, don't really allow us to look at the whole brain. Uh, and probably, fundamentally, this is an issue of signal attenuation. And one approach that we have sort of taken uh, is to see if robotics can help us uh, bridge some of these experimental skills. I'm going to talk about three uh, general directions where we have developed robotic systems that allow us to perform very precise single neuron recording and perturbation. Uh, briefly touch upon how these uh, tools can be used, the robotic aspects of this can be parallelized to study intact uh, circuit. And some of the more recent work that we've been doing, we have been doing uh, within our lab where we're trying to see if we can extend uh, techniques that allow us to look at cellular cellular activity from very isolated brain regions to mapping activity across much larger scales uh, through, uh, distributed throughout the brain. So, when we look at single cells, uh, uh, traditionally the way we do these recordings is using uh, uh, single cell probes uh, or glass microneedles. Uh, this is uh, a technique that's called patch clamping that was established in the late 70s, early 80s, where you essentially take a glass microneedle, uh, fill it with a conducting saline solution, and it's important to sort of establish uh, the scales at which you are operating, a neuron is typically 20 to 30 micrometers. The glass microneedle is even smaller at the tip, maybe one to two micrometers. You have microscopic uh, imaging that allows you to precisely manipulate this glass microneedle, bring it in delicate contact with the cell, uh, and you typically have a tube that's attached to the back end of the pipette where you apply a gentle suction to suck a patch of this cell's membrane in to establish a very tight uh, seal with the cell. Uh, and, the, and this is from uh, uh, the Nieher and Sachman's work. Uh, they eventually went on to win the Nobel Prize for developing this technique. Uh, there are multiple variants. Uh, the most popular one to study neurons uh, would be to punch a hole through the patch that's uh, trapped in the pipe tip to get what is called a hole cell recording. And this is an incredibly powerful technique where it allows you to study the cell's uh, electrophysiological properties. It allows you to harvest the single cell contents to look at gene expression or infuse dyes to look at the morphology of the cell. But fundamentally, it's a, a bit of an art form. Uh, it's one of those techniques that uh, grad students in neuroscience will typically take uh, a few months, if not years, to get good at. Uh, and patch clamp studies are typically low throughput, uh, and so it precludes the large-scale studies. So how do you study 70 million neurons in a mouse brain? And it fundamentally lacks scalability because of the difficulty in which you prefer that uh, it needs to perform. Uh, we cannot use fat clamping, for instance, to record for multiple cells simultaneously. And some of the work that 
a lot of the work that we've done is trying to see if we can automate. So for instance, if you have a glass micro needle and a tube that's attached to a computer controlled pressure system, we can use uh, feedback from uh, the electrical impedance of the pipette uh, to control this uh, pipette's position and the pressure to establish uh, a contact with the cell. And so this is work that I did as a grad student uh, and then later on as a postdoc, where I developed algorithms that can guide this micro needle uh, at depth and at pressure to a uh, certain depth into the brain. Uh, and then you slowly scan through the brain tissue uh, at steps of two to three micrometers. You're applying slight positive pressure to this pipette. So you have fluid coming out and it helps you push away some of the smaller dendrites and other processes that are difficult to hold on to for recording while simultaneously sending in pulses of voltage and measuring the current flowing through the tip of the pipette. And what we found was that as uh, these pipettes approach a large cell body, for instance, uh, uh, this is what is the soma of the cell, uh, there are stereotypical increases in pipette resistance that you can use as a feedback to stop this micropipette from advancing at uh, micro, micro steps. And then you, uh, activate the pressure systems that's not shown here, but it's in the back end that sucks this patch membrane and allows you to establish what is called a holes in recording. So now you have uh, the ability to record the current, infuse dyes, so you can sort of uh, tag the cell and look at the morphology in a postdoc experiment. Or what would be exciting would be, and some of the techniques that we're trying to do is to see if we can harvest the genetic contents of the cell to look at its transcriptomic profile. So this was in 2012, uh, it's just some data showing how this robot works. Again, you are measuring the electrical resistance. When it makes contact with the cell, this resistance starts increasing monotonically uh, in a stereotypical fraction. And if it goes above a certain threshold, the robot stops. And this is where the fluidics take over and you establish a giga seal and break in and establish whole cell pattern, right? Uh, and back then we showed that a robot like this, uh, which was trained to record from cortical cells could be generalized to record from hippocampus, which is a different brain region. Uh, and the quality of the mirror recordings was comparable to a well-trained human practitioner. Uh, so, the resting membrane potential typically for neurons need to be about negative 65, which is what we saw. And we were able to, for instance, record from cortical neurons, uh, hippocampal neurons, and also fill these cells with biocytin. So you can sort of look at what kind of anatomical structure these cells have. Now, for better or worse, uh, when we talk about lab automation, we have this Jetsonian impression, right? So you want to press a button and you want the robots to do everything for you, uh, which is actually much harder, uh, especially in biological context uh, than what people appreciate. So this is the algorithm that we developed in 2012. Uh, the grayed out blocks are those that uh, typically needed a human to perform. Uh, and one of the limiting steps for patching is that the glass micro needle that you use is single use. Uh, you can't, you don't necessarily, you can't use it multiple times to get multiple recordings. And what we had automated was uh, the steps that we show in the block, uh, in the gray block. Uh, ideally, the dream would be to uh, essentially surgerize a mouse, open a craniotomy, and the robot does an entire experiment for you. And this is what we demonstrated more recently, where we built a series of uh, fluid uh, control robot, fluid handling robots surrounding our path clamping robot, which can take a series of uh, glass micro needles that are sitting in a carousel. Uh, we fill it up with uh, the recording solution using a pipette filling station. Uh, and then once the pipettes are filled, uh, the uh, robotic arm can take it, interface it with a head stage. Uh, we establish uh, both a pneumatic as well as an electrical uh, contact with the recording head stage. That's the amplifier that's used to do the neuronal recordings. Uh, and this process can be repeated many times over. So one can imagine fully autonomous patch clamping robots performing arguably one of the 
more difficult uh, neuroscience uh, uh, experiment uh, completely without any human intervention. Uh, and so once we have the ability to record from a single cell, uh, a single patch pipette in uh, an automated fashion, uh, one of the advantages of robotics is that you have the ability to now parallelize these, right? Uh, pretty, uh, in a relatively straightforward fashion. Uh, so here's uh, the patch clamping robot now with parallelized hardware where we have four patch pipettes for robotic arms, uh, each controlling uh, patch clamp uh, robot. Uh, we have a slightly more complicated pressure system that can individually control the pressure to each pipette. Uh, and then, and so this is uh, showing uh, sort of the physical uh, system in photograph form. Uh, to give you a sense of scale, this is about three feet. Uh, and these sort of robotic arm swarms uh, are going into a piece of tissue that is about 200 micrometers uh, by 200 micrometers uh, wide, uh, and trying to record from individual cells uh, that are potentially synaptically connected. And the black uh, tab that you see is uh, what we implant on the mouse to head fix, similar to the setups uh, that are shown in the previous talk where you're head fixing uh, a fly. Here we're doing this with a mouse. Uh, and as the number of electrodes increased, uh, really what you're doing is you're controlling swarms of patch clamping robots, uh, wherein you need to start thinking about how these robotic arms can cooperate with each other to optimally find multiple neurons simultaneously. And so uh, this work that I did through most of my postdoc was trying to figure out the optimal strategies for guiding multiple patch pipettes in an automated fashion uh, to establish uh, patch clamp recordings from multiple cells uh, and uh, getting a recording. So here's uh, an example of uh, what we think is for the first time in an awake head fix mouse, uh, recordings from four different neurons while from the battle cortex, which is uh, part of the mouse brain that processes information uh, that is being received from the whisker system. Uh, and you can sort of see how the membrane potential of the multiple neurons are co correlated with the motion of these viscous. Uh, now, one of the questions that kept coming up was that uh, when you're using electrical impedance, you're going deep into the brain, you're essentially blind uh, in the sense that uh, the robot is essentially recording from the first neuron it encounters, but in a many in a number of contexts, what is more uh, uh, useful would be to be able to pinpoint a certain type of cell, uh, maybe a pyramidal cell, which is the triangular cells that are shown in cartoon form, or the star-shaped interneurons that are more sparse, and be able to record from that. Right, uh, and what we did in subsequent work was to combine. Uh, two photon laser scanning microscopy that allows us to image this uh, live tissue in 3D space. And if you have a fluorescent tag in specific types of cells that you want to record from, uh, you can then combine computer vision, uh, which allows you to pinpoint the location of a cell of interest in 3D space, uh, the tip of a pipette in 3D space, and you can now, uh, uh, this sort of reduces down to a trajectory uh, uh, determining the trajectory of the pipette that uh, you need to compute to be able to guide it to a specific location. So, uh, and in this work, for instance, we showed that, you know, if you have a fluorescent tag, in, uh, in this case, an uh, interneuron, uh, you can guide a pipette and automatically record from this in a targeted fashion. Uh, and you can do this for other types of cells, for instance, excitatory cells. Uh, and this allows us a greater degree of control uh, in the type of experiments that we can do. Uh, now, fundamentally, this idea that you can use microscopic imaging uh, to image a 3D piece of tissue and uh, uh, and use that uh, information to uh, target uh, specific uh, types of cells, uh, either to record or uh, even manipulate them, uh, can be very powerful, and we're sort of ex 
expanding on this concept in a couple of different contexts that I wanted to sort of highlight. And this is work done by a former master student, uh, Gabriela Schell, who's a PhD student at Duke now, uh, and was done in collaboration with Julian Hutton's group, who's fundamentally interested in understanding how neural stem cells during very specific location uh, times uh, during development give rise to mature neurons. Uh, and in this case, Gabriela uh, uh, developed a robot that can uh, perform microscopic imaging of a piece of uh, organotypic slice uh, that can be cultured uh, in in vitro, uh, ex vivo for uh, a couple of days. And she's able to uh, use a micro injector robot uh, that's computer vision guided to tag uh, the progenitor stem cells that are present 20 to 30 micrometers below the surface of the line that you annotate. And what you showed in this work was that these kind of robotic strategies can provide us with a throughput that is significantly higher than uh, what you can get from other things. Uh, and we're sort of expanding on this in terms of can we use this to robotically barcode single cells uh, in uh, uh, brain slices, incorporating machine vision and uh, uh, machine learning so we can automatically detect cells. Uh, and load marker, uh, genetic tags that can be used for transcriptome-wide profiling of uh, identified neurons and infect tissue. And with the time left, uh, I want to sort of highlight one other project where we're using robots to access and image large parts of the mouse brain. Uh, in this context, typically an exercise that I do with incoming grad students is uh, where I use a stress ball and throw it at them. And this tells us a very simple sensory motor task where they need to look at uh, the incoming visual information, use that information to either catch the ball or avoid it. Uh, and this is a process that's mediated by several different uh, brain regions. Uh, and while we have traditionally been really good at looking at uh, individual brain regions uh, in great detail, much less is known about how multiple brain regions coordinate their activity. And if we need to do this at large scale, we need to use uh, modalities such as calcium imaging that allow us to uh, image neural activity uh, in lieu of uh, recording, uh, which allows us to uh, capture much larger brain regions. And we can do this uh, along with other tools such as optogenetics. Now the question is, how do we, in a mouse brain, access uh, under the problem that we are trying to solve is, can we record from every neuron in the cortex? Uh, and so this sort of breaks down into a problem of gaining optical access. You need some way to surgically remove a very large part of the mouse's skull, replace that with a transparent barrier and uh, other optical technologies that allow us to image them. And so uh, this is work that was done by Ma Matt Ryan, a PhD student in the group, uh, along with Laila Gandhari. Uh, where they programmed a CNC machine to profile the surface of the mouse, the skull of a mouse, uh, uh, and use that information to automatically perform a microsurgical procedure. And we're using this, uh, and we're performing this with relatively simple uh, CNC machines uh, adapted to immobilize mice. Uh, uh, they, we have. Uh, low force contact sensor that's attached to the CNC mill. Uh, it uses uh, information from the low force contact sensor to create a 3D profile of the mouse uh, skull surface and precisely drill out the skull uh, uh, using computer numerical machining routines. And we showed that we could use this technique to perform very precise surgical operations, for instance, excising out a circular region replacing that with a glass cover slip so you can ima image through this glass cover slip at cellular resolution. Uh, more importantly, we could perform operations such as removing the entire skull over the dorsal cortex of the mouse and replacing that with a 3D printed barrier. Uh, so you use the CNC mill to profile the skull surface, use that information to recreate a morphologically realistic polymer skull uh, that can be implanted over the mouse head for very long durations of time. And this allows us to 
perform mesoscale imaging where you can image the activity of the entire cortex simultaneously using transgenic mice that are expressing proteins that change their fluorescent intensity as a function of neural activity. Uh, use the same mouse, uh, use two photon imaging to look at uh, individual neural circuits at high resolution. And we can do this uh, essentially in a sort of random access fashion uh, with access to uh, over a million neurons uh, at the surface of the mouse brain. Uh, I believe I'm out of time. So with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge the group. Uh, some uh, people like Lila have graduated. Uh, this is the current group. Uh, I, I believe I highlighted Jacob's work on the barcoding, robotic barcoding, and Matt's work with the CNC machine uh, that can do microsurgical procedures. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And so as uh, Devesh just put into the chat, if you can put your questions into the chat window, I will um, read them out for our speakers. And I can go ahead and get things. Should I or somebody else sharing? can. What's that? Oh, yeah. Stop sharing? yeah. Yeah, then we can see a little more easily. Okay, since uh, Suar, since you were just talking, I'm gonna, um, I'll I'll start in asking a question for you. So you'd mentioned um, the swarms of robotic arms for doing the cortical recordings, and I'm curious. Um, there's sort of more broadly speaking, there's been quite a bit of work over the you know recent decade done on swarms of robotics and um, uh, swarms of robots. Can you say a bit about um, what sort of general techniques from that that literature are applicable here and what is not? Because there's been just a lot of different things done. Oh, you're muted. Can we unmute Swasa? Uh, so, one thing I do want to note is while I do say it's swarm, uh, we are still looking at relatively small number of electrodes. And what I was referring to is the need for them to account for the fact that as one uh, robotic probe is moving through tissue, uh, it is simultaneously displacing it. And at the micro scale, it's important to account for those displacements uh, while you're trying to establish this really tight. Uh, uh, seal with uh, with a particular neuron, and so uh, a lot of uh, the optimization that we needed to do was trying to figure out in that context while you have these probes moving through a deformable uh, piece of tissue, uh, what is the optimum way to get as many neurons as possible uh, from each of them? Uh, so not necessarily uh, in the sense that the way we talk about swarms of drones and uh, some of those strategies that uh, are needed when you have much larger number of probes. Cool. I mean, I could continue asking questions about so, that for extended period of time. Somebody else else have a question? Yes, I was going to just ask for uh, one question. Uh, do you worry about refractive index uh, issues between different neurons uh, for your optical measurements? Yes, uh, that's a big issue uh, in the sense that, you know, whenever you have uh, neurons, which are lipids, and then you have uh, water, and that's the primary source of scattering in tissue. And so even with uh, the two photon optics that we use, uh, we can only image down to about 500 micrometers. Uh, although people have developed uh, three photon imaging techniques that allow you to go down to about uh, a millimeter or so, but beyond that, uh, because uh, this is a really heterogeneous uh, medium, uh, scattering is one of the big limiting factors when you want to do image-guided uh, robotics. Does that answer your question, Ranjan? Yes, that's great. Devish. Um, okay, we have a question here for Dr. Monjo. You, have you observed any double flapping of wings as compensation for an injured wing on flies or birds or in walking? 
Um, I've lost oh, there you are. Okay, sorry, I lost track of where you were in the grid. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I guess I have a question back to Allison. I'm not sure what you mean by double flapping. Do you mean like the, the wings in phase or what, what exactly are you uh, referring to by double flapping? I think maybe it, to me, it sounds like it's sort of like a stuttering kind of motion to try and compensate. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I mean, like a double flapping, so just flapping twice, maybe not just a greater um, range of motion of flap. I see. So what's interesting about uh, that's it's an interesting question. So the um, uh, so at the scale that I'm talking about, the insect scale. Uh, so they have an indirect drive to drive the wings. And so uh, it's actually through the contraction of the thorax that the wings are moving. And these the wings are mechanically a couple to this thorax. Uh, and so one compensation that we found is that um, the wings elevate the wing beat frequency as a result of injury. So they are, in a sense, flapping faster. Uh, but we haven't observed what I think I understand as a sort of a double flap in one cycle. Uh, and, and part of this is that there's sort of limited degrees of freedom available to the fly. For example, if the fly wants to increase its flapping frequencies, both wings have to flap at the same frequency because of this mechanical constraint on this basically uh, underactuated system. Does that answer your question? Have, that answers the question with respect to your research. Have you um, read in any research of maybe other creatures that aren't underactuated, if that happens? Because I know I know that um, from my studies of human motor controls, um, if you there's this one study um, where they basically take young children who just learned how to walk and they put them on this split speed treadmill with mm -hmm. one of the treadmills um, parts going faster and then babies will do a double step on one leg whereas adult humans will not do that they just take a longer stride so i wondered if there mm -hmm. was something um yeah, so I wonder so, how much of that is like a learned thing with young creatures versus older, or if that is just something unique to humans. Yeah, so I'm not familiar with that that literature in, in a split belt split belt treadmill uh, uh, community. Um, yeah, I I don't think the flies have the capability of doing that due to the constraint on the mechanical system. Um, but it's an interesting. Yeah, it's you know the. Here, what, what we're a little bit puzzled by, and that's something I, I didn't quite get to just in, for, because of time, is that um, we're not quite sure about the time scale at which flies are sort of, you know, if, it, if they're really learning these new kinematics, um, right? Because they're, they're changing their wing beat amplitudes. And right now we're working on trying to understand if they're changing other parameters of their wings because they effectively have three Euler angles they can control in their wings. And so we're not sure about exactly how the other degrees of freedoms are changing and the time scale at which these changes happen for the flight to reach this sort of new steady state. Um, and that's something we're working on now to try to quantify that period of, you know, either adaptive control or learning. Uh, we don't quite know what to call it because learning usually in, is usually defined as like a longer time scale kind of uh, task. Whereas here, this might be happening within a couple wing strokes, right? For a fly, otherwise they would tumble and that would be the end, right? So um, yeah, so that's a, it's a good question. Thank you. It's like, it's not really a, well, to put in like the human form, I guess, um, a voluntary control, it's more of just an automatic that's something we're trying to understand. You know, what the yeah, whether it is just kind of happening because it's a robust control system, right? That's what I was trying to get at. This is a well-tuned control system that can compensate for these, you know, asymmetries uh, in torque production, or is it something else? Is it actually there is a learning phase that happens very very fast where the fly is adapting its gains until it reaches an appropriate uh, state. 
Thank you. All right, I have another question for Suasa. Uh, so the the probes that you've been developing, so you're ha you're basically making an array of probes. I'm sorry, I'm going back to the swarm thing, uh, a little bit, but you, you're making an array of probes. And have you done some quantification about um, uh, performance of that approach versus these, like the the sort of uh, rigid arrays of probes that people use. So the ones that I've I've seen more often are like like these five by five or ten by ten grid of probes that's put into a brain. I mean, I think often they miss several cells. So is it is it like your approach? You're aiming to make sure that every single probe hits a cell of use. Is that? Oh, I think you're muted again. Yeah, so our approach, uh, we're trying to establish intracellular recordings uh, in the sense that uh, we establish this seal with the cell uh, and then you poke a hole and this allows you to measure the intracellular currents. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of the rigid arrays that you're talking about, uh, you can pack a lo lot more electrodes and yeah. you can get close to a cell and you can potentially record from uh, individual action potentials from cells that are close by, yeah, but yeah. not necessarily how a single cell is, for instance, integrating information within it. Uh, and there are other things you can do with an intracellular recording probe that uh, can be advantageous, uh, for instance, measuring synaptic currents and so on. Uh, so, slightly different modality. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I have some other questions from the audience here. And um, organizers, uh, what is, I, I didn't ask actually how we're supposed to wrap this up. I apologize. Uh, are we supposed to go all the way to two or? No, just, so we'll finish in a couple of minutes, but it'll be open uh, for other people to stay on and talk to either you and the speakers if they want to. We'll okay. stop the recording in a couple of minutes. Awesome. I'm actually curious, where is everybody from here who's over in the participant list? Do you, do you track that as part of overall management of the? We have been tracking a few of them, so I can recognize few names, but not everyone. If you don't have other question, I think we can write, wrap it up. And uh, I'd like to take and first, thank Christy uh, for moderating this, and both the speaker, Sean Michael and Suasa. Thank you very much for exciting talk. Thanks, David, uh, for organizing. And these talks will be post posted online. The recording will be posted online, and you will see some of the people are even watching it uh, after the seminar has been over. We have seen some of these talks have over 200 views in the last uh, six weeks. So, nice. so the pe people are watching it uh, asynchronously also. So thank you, and when you can stop recording, and if you want to talk to the speaker, you can unmute your mic and video, and you.